Why are we still fascinated by Maria Callas 100 years after her birth? How did she become a legend? Gossip and scandal around her personal life still makes headlines. But as an artist, although there have been other singers who have been compared to her, or who have invited comparisons themselves, no one really has even come close. To understand why, we're going to have to put La Divina in context, to learn about the great tradition which almost died with her, to which she gave one last hurrah. So I hope you'll join me today as we explore what made La Callas the greatest of her time, and whether she was actually the greatest of all time. Won't you? <laughs> Welcome to Phantoms of the Opera. I am your host, and today my guest ghost for a second time is Maria Callas herself. I sat down with Madame Callas ahead of her centenary to talk about her legacy. You know, I must say that I've caused a little bit of change, and I hope a better change in our art. I feel like, in all the discussions around Callas today, there's something missing. The one thing that gets ignored or misunderstood again and again is the one thing she really wanted to pass on and share with the world, the bel canto tradition. So today we're going on a deep dive into the history and hopefully the future of opera and the unique place Callas holds there. We'll get a bit technical, but if you're not a musician, don't be scared. I'm going to try to make it easy to follow along but please put on headphones so you can hear the detail in the musical examples without distortion. I come from the same tradition as Callas, and I have devoted many years of practical research reconstructing the training methods and performance styles of this school through the 18th and 19th centuries. I've learnt a lot while making this video, and I hope it gives you a lot to think about too. And if it does, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe if you want to learn more about Callas, the history of opera, and bel canto. Thank you. La tradition veut que lorsqu'on commence une émission, euh, le présentateur présente, comme on dit, celui ou celle qui est l'hôte d'honneur de cette émission. Et généralement, ce sont des gens très connus. Alors on emploie une formule un peu hypocrite, on dit « on ne présente pas monsieur un tel ou madame une telle », mais on les présente quand même en réalité. Et alors avec vous, je vais vous le dire, je n'ai pas osé. Parce que je crois que vous êtes l'une des deux ou trois personnes dans le monde du spectacle qui sont tellement connues, que même les gens qui ne vous ont jamais vu et jamais entendu connaissent votre nom. Chances are that if you are watching this video, you already have an idea of who Maria Callas was. But here's a brief refresher. Maria Callas's career began in the 1940s, and she became an international star during the 1950s, due to her opera performances across Europe and America, and her numerous records. She brought in new audiences unacquainted with opera. But she was divisive. Many opera goers found a lot to criticize in her. Today, I want to argue that her approach to singing, her technique, style and attitude, is not as exceptional as it seems to us now, but really something very old that has been largely forgotten. It is the old schooling which does not exist, unfortunately, anymore. But I don't mean to imply that she wasn't special. First, there was her voice. She had a wide range, encompassing soprano and contralto. She had power, and a unique timbre. And there was her acting ability. Both visually and in her voice, she embodied the characters she presented with complete commitment. Je pense que Maria Callas, en plus d'être une très grande euh, cantatrice, je crois qu'elle est une très grande actrice. Merci. Je l'ai toujours pensé, tu Merci. le sais. Parce que je crois que même si tu n'avais pas chanté sur la scène lyrique, tu aurais été quand même énorme. 
Mais oui, mais je veux dire, c'est un compliment, tu sais. She was also a beauty, which isn't necessary to be a star, but my goodness, doesn't it help? As the impresario James Henry Mapleson put it in 1863, it is seldom that nature lavishes on one person all the gifts which are needed to form a great soprano. A voice whose register entitles it to claim this rank is of the rarest order. Melodious quality and power, which are not less essential than extended register, are equally scarce. Musical knowledge, executive finish, and perfect intonation indispensable, and to these the prima donna should add dramatic force and adaptability, together with a large amount of personal grace. Even these rare endowments will not suffice unless they are illumined by the fire of genius. By one only of living artists has this high ideal been reached, by Mademoiselle Titians. I'm no longer surprised at you knowing only one prima donna, Mr. Mapleson. Yeah, I rather wonder at you knowing any. Yes, the combination of a great voice, musical genius, acting talent and beauty is rare but not once in a century rare. However, when Callas made her debut, the standard of singing was lower than it had been in the previous century. And that's why, with her old school training, she stood out. In the 20th century, Callas was almost unique for her level of agility and power, subtlety and variety of color and technical precision. Whereas in the 19th century, she would have had a lot more competition. This old schooling is called bel canto. This is the name given to the ancient Italian school of singing dating back to about the year 1600 when opera was invented. It was gradually overtaken by new ideas during the 19th century until only a few exponents remained in the 20th century. Verismo is a term used for certain operas written in the late 19th and early 20th centuries which aimed to present everyday stories of common people, in contrast to the stories of gods and kings of the previous centuries, through music which was stripped of embellishment and therefore meant to be more expressive and realistic. Mais Verisme, chez nous, ça s'appelle, disons, de, de l'époque de Mascagni, de Puccini. C'est pour ça que j'aime beaucoup moins cette espèce de musique, parce que aussi, surtout, aujourd'hui, on exagère. Pour faire de Verisme, on fait des des choses un tout petit peu vulgaires. Et alors, euh, évidemment, ça ne fait pas du bien à la voix aussi. What is rarely talked about is the new way of singing that was developed as a response to this change in composition. Early Verismo singers and late bel canto singers can be hard to tell apart on record because they do sound similar in tone and in their use of legato, but you can hear the difference in their use of registers, vibrato and agility. I've made a video covering some of these differences already, but the main thing is, the bel canto singers could sing the new Verismo music. The Verismo singers couldn't sing the old bel canto. Renata Tabaldi, for example, was a superb Verismo singer. The press was keen to compare her with Callas and stir up a rivalry between them. Now, you said uh, Tabaldi challenging me. How can she challenge me? Can she sing the operas I sing? No. no. So, uh, may I say another thing? Rivalry. We have no, no such thing between us. Because I have no rival now. Because up to the moment that another soprano will do exactly what I do, the repertoire I do, the way I act, the way I am, and everything is quite different from my colleagues, though I admire them enormously. So, up to the point that these um, so-called rivals of mine, without being disrespectful, until they do exactly what I do, then I will consider them my rivals. By the 1950s, the differences between bel canto and verismo singing had become more pronounced. It's possible verismo was influenced by the 19th century German school, but I don't have time to talk about all the complexities today. A darkened tone made by lowering the larynx was the new ideal whereas bel canto had always emphasized a brighter tone and light vocalization with a mobile larynx. My teacher always kept me on the light side. She knew I was a very heavy voice, 
But she knew also that such heavy voices should always be kept limber. You must always keep the voice lighter than what she is and agile. Heavy lower larynx singing might be thrilling to listen to, but it does deteriorate the voice over time. If you don't have the bel canto way of singing, which is the schooling, the proper schooling, you just frankly cannot sing for a long time. You might be able to sing on youth, shall we say, on energy for a few years, but it won't last. I have been brought up since a very early age, thank God, and uh, I'm lucky for that, into the bel canto uh, world. So it is none, not a merit of mine. I just happened to be born at a period where I just caught the last bit of these people that were very competent. I had the good fortune of having Elvira de Hidalgo for my teacher in Greece during the war, so I automatically was born into the bel canto method. She had the great training, maybe even the last great training of the real bel canto. So, as a young girl, which means 13 years old, I was thrown into her arms, meaning that I learned the secrets, that I learned the ways of this bel canto, which of course, as you well know, is not beautiful singing. It is a way of music. This is something people often misunderstand because they literally translate the Italian bello as beautiful, but actually it can also mean good. The bel canto does not mean beautiful singing. It means the technique. Wasn't your bel canto training actually a handicap at the start of your career? They really came to me when they just couldn't find another one to cast in the role. By the time Callas was making her debut in Italy, bel canto was associated with the trope of canaries. The term canaries refers to light-voiced singers that warbled a lot of quick notes like a little songbird in a virtuosic but emotionless display. This sort of agility, which we call coloratura or florid singing, tends to come easily to smaller, lighter voices, but it takes a lot more work for naturally bigger, heavier voices to acquire it. What I mean by big voices, intense voices, power of expression, uh, of colours, and of uh, mel melodic line. In earlier centuries, all singers were trained to sing the fast notes as well as the slow. In fact, it was considered an essential part of vocal training and a very healthy study for the voice. But by the end of the 19th century, most teachers and students had dropped agility training and music requiring coloratura ability was left to the small voices that had it naturally, the canaries. But there's actually so much more to bel canto than rapid vocalising. I had struggles in Italy. I think they found a new element in me. What they considered bel canto was just a beautiful voice singing. They were disturbed by this strange interpretation which made them work a little harder, made them feel a little more. Instead of saying, oh what a lovely voice, oh what a lovely note, oh how nice, how pleasant, well let's go home. But they learned to appreciate what you were doing. Well they didn't immediately with me, but they would when they heard another singer. Then they would say, oh but she's boring, no I think the other performance was better. They can't say what it was, but they felt that they weren't satisfied with it. Je me rappelle très bien de ça. C'était le mois d'octobre de 1948. Euh, C'était peu de jours que j'étais nominé directeur artistique à la Maison Musicale Florentin. Et alors, il m'arrive un coup de téléphone du maître Maestro Serafine. Et il me dit, écoutez, Gianni, vous devez venir tout de suite à Rome, parce que j'ai une rencontrer une artiste. Elle veut partir pour l'Amérique, elle veut laisser l'Italie. Et si je n'ai pas la, une chance de la faire rester, je ne peux pas euh, faire rester en, en Italie. J'avais pas beaucoup de contrats dans le temps. <rire> Et nous sommes rencontrés à la maison de Maestro Serafine. Il m'a chanté un morceau d'énorme. Et un autre morceau. 
Et j'ai commencé à écouter quelque chose ici. Comment ça s'appelle la, la chair de poule. La chair de poule. <rire> la chair de poule. Les programmes, lorsque j'ai été arrivé à Florence, c'était déjà prêt. Mais j'ai dit alors, maintenant, nous mettons un bas programme à notre opéra. Madame Callas reste en Italie, pas en Amérique. Elle vient à Florence et commence à, elle commence à travailler. En Italie, sa grande carrière. Elle a fait le, le, le début dans le grand répertoire de Bel Canto avec Norme. Je vous dis franchement que les théâtres, c'était fou, enthousiaste. Alors j'ai pensé vraiment, on peut renouveler. À nuit sainte que nous avons toujours rêvé, mais que nous n'avons plus une tradition. Alors j'ai fait tout ce qui était possible. At that time, they considered the bel canto roles as light roles, which they are not. Norma is written for the same voice that sang Puritani, Lucia, Sonnambula, so she's definitely a dramatic coloratura. In fact, Lucia is a very low role, and light sopranos have to put the third act high. When this music was written... In the early 19th century? Yes. The soprano then was soprano assoluto, with all the possibilities of bel canto embellishments and so on. She had to be soprano, then there was the contralto, and that was all. They didn't specialize? No, because then you could not sing if you didn't have your schooling. You just couldn't sing, and that was all. Now, we have refined it to such a state that, well, if the soprano doesn't have a trill or doesn't have a scale, never mind. There is no never mind. You can't find a pianist or a violinist not being able to perform his ornaments and scales. Uh... And the basics. Exactly. Once upon a time, you would be considered second rate. Technique is the equipment that one needs to interpret the music. We have to express ourselves with embellishments, without embellishments, with color, with notes, with every possible technical necessity. So you see, a trill is necessary, a glissando is necessary, and all these little technical things are absolutely necessary for our equipment as a musician and an interpreter. We are not doing anything special. We are doing what we are supposed to. It's written there. We have to. So, what exactly is bel canto? That is the schooling. The bel canto is definitely the schooling. So, if you don't have the bel canto, you cannot sing any opera as a matter of fact. Well, that's pretty decisive. I think we can end the video there. <laughs> <laughs> can you expand on that a little for us? The basis of singing whether it's Wagner, Mozart, Verdi or Puccini, you must know how to sing. Bel canto means the exact same schooling that violinists, pianists, all the instrumentists go through. The approach, the attack of the note, it must always be attacked purely with no slurs, with no slides. Each note has a reason to exist a way to be pronounced and given, but should never be touched but on the note. So by that you mean there should be no scooping up to the note and no harsh glottal articulations? A pure attack is the basis of bel canto. And not swelling into every note. The legato, the phrase must be legato. And by legato I don't mean sliding. Legato is very difficult to explain and describe. I made a video on it already and I realise a lot of people still didn't quite get it, so I'm going to make one or two more because it's so important. I realise that legato has, at some point, come to mean a mushy, indistinct articulation. But in the bel canto school, it was the way of connecting every note into one cohesive phrase while still maintaining clarity and precision. Intonation is also a necessity. But of course, it's hard work and it is a great schooling. 
years and years of dominating the voice to do what an instrumentist would do, you have to do the same with the voice absolutely, whether you sing Wagner or anything under the sun. So, how is that done? Well, the method is learnt on the solfege, scales, trills. Uh, it is a production that keeps your voice light. Uh, it's not so easily put in words. <laughs> They've written quite a few books on it, but I think they're too intellectual. And uh, you can't learn singing from a book. The problem is, it is so hard, or even impossible, to write down. And that's why it was passed on by oral tradition for hundreds of years. But it is flexibility, pushing the instrument into a certain zone where it might not be too large in sound, but penetrating. And with the correct placement, that means where the voice resonates, all that should be effortless. And above that, the vocal projection and so many things, you learn how to interpret, how to be on stage, how to act. So, technically, you're exactly prepared for it, but then you must bring it off to the public as extremely easy. Uh. These things are very difficult to speak about. I'm not good at words. I understand you. So what did you study with Elvira de Hidalgo? We studied on Panofka, on Concone. So those are some collections of vocalises, which are like a song without words, teaching a certain aspect of technique, or sometimes several together, depending on the difficulty level. They're just exercises, like... An athlete, little by little, builds his strength, his muscles. I think pianists use the same approach. They work on a slow scale first, and then they increase the rapidity. Yes, that's the great secret of learning agility, which isn't really a secret at all. But it does take a long time, and a lot of singers are happy to skip that and approximate it instead. Well, then you cannot sing, period. How will you get out of a trill? How will you get out of scales when they're written there, looking you in the face? You cannot cheat, but it is a very hard training. It's a sort of a straitjacket that you're supposed to put on, whether you like it or not. It is not enough to have a beautiful voice. What does that mean? When you have to interpret a role, you have to have thousands of colours to portray the words. You must take this voice and break it up to a thousand pieces, so she will serve you in all the written phrases, coloratura, and expressions that you must do. You see, the instrumentists only have notes. We have words. We have drama or comedy. So our work is even more serious and difficult. That's very true. But the convention these days is to teach through songs, not so much on scales and other exercises, hoping the student will find out along the way how to ornament or phrase, etc. Rather than learning all the necessary skills first and then applying them. These you cannot learn once you're on stage because then it's too late. That's why you go to the conservatoire. If there are good teachers in any case, because the basis is the most important thing in singing. If you start right, you're on for life. But if you start wrong, well, you can't get rid of bad faults. You must learn interpretation, the styles, all the acrobatism that goes with it, the vocalizing plus the harmonizing, music, in other words. Sadly, I don't think you'll find all that at a conservatoire anymore. Well, this is the problem. It is the old schooling which does not exist, unfortunately, anymore. We are just servants of art. We serve art, and that is our first purpose. Now, if you do that, you're great, you're famous, you have money, but the work is hard in the beginning, during, and after. That is why I say that it's a lifetime job. And that's why you're always, always studying. You must set yourself a standard which is a whip. So you see, that's the way I am. That's the way I've been brought up. That was the way great artists were once upon a time. Let's go over again what defines the bel canto school. A cultivated natural tone, free, bright, and penetrating. 
That means it's not artificially produced, darkened, throaty, or nasal. And it also means by using your unique resonance, you sound like no one else. Flexibility with lightness, precision, and true intonation. This is not just for showing off, but for healthy singing. Even if you're mostly singing music that doesn't include coloratura, you have to practice it. Legato line, which is a constant flow, always present in the music. It actually makes singing much easier. Expression. Bel canto and opera develop together. Bel canto is opera. Opera is theatre, expressing drama and feeling through music. The Italian term chiaroscuro means light and shade, and describes the contrasts of timbre and volume used to express a variety of ideas and emotions. We've not yet mentioned register training, but I've made a video explaining registers a bit already. Briefly, they're like gears. If you want to go higher or lower comfortably and with ease, you need to change gear. Some schools use one or two registers, but generally, bel canto taught three, for female voices anyway. It's complicated. Having control of three registers instead of one, and being able to mix them, gives a singer many more tonal colours to play with. In Verismo, a uniform sound across the entire range is preferred, without any changes of gear. All of this is done with the aim of long-term vocal health and the possibility of a long career. Bel canto sounds so easy and so pleasant to listen to because it is not putting any strain on the voice. This is done by avoiding extremes, such as forcing or shouting, singing on the throat, singing constantly with dark tone, or constantly with vibrato, overusing your highest or lowest notes. These were all known to wear out a voice prematurely. It's important to point out that these six things are not exclusive to bel canto on their own, but only with all of them coming together to be greater than the sum of their parts can it be called bel canto. It's not so surprising after all that it takes up to 10 years to learn everything, but although born stars may be rare, with the bel canto schooling, singing of high caliber doesn't have to be. So, now, let's hear an example of bel canto. Callas made this record in 1949. It's an aria from the role that changed her life when she stepped in for an indisposed Elvira in Ipuritani. Here are some things to listen out for. Expression. You'll hear this extract starts with an audible gasp, <gasps> as though she's gently weeping. Agility some light, accurate downward scales, contrast, switching suddenly to a louder, fuller tone and then back again, lightness, her high notes are very easy and sweet but full, unbroken legato throughout, she's using minimal vibrato and the words are perfectly clear. But what happens if you take just one of those essential elements of bel canto away? Well, Callas can demonstrate that for us too. Let's listen to some of her predecessors and play a little game of Spot the Difference. Let's take the dramatic coloratura role of Leonora in Il Trovatore, 
first sung with great success by Rosina Penko in 1853. Unfortunately, we don't have any records of her. Callas first sang this role in 1950 in Mexico. Let's listen to a very little bit of Lillian Nordica, the great Wagnerian soprano. She made a test record of the first aria from Trovatore in 1908, but she was unhappy with the results, so it was not released. According to Hermann Klein, she never achieved a record that was truly worthy of her, or that conveyed the thrill of her beautiful tone. This test record is in poor condition, but although the tone might not be thrilling, her vocalising certainly is. Now let's hear Callas sing the same thing. Nordica is keeping it very light and legato, even as she flips between registers with great precision. But Callas starts to sound heavy by comparison. Can you hear that? We can clearly tell that Callas came from the same tradition as Nordica. She's still got the flexibility, the legato, three distinct registers, but there's now some verismo in there too. It's that heavier, darker sound. You'll be able to hear more detail in the next records, so we can explore how that seemingly small change makes a big difference and how it will cause more problems as we go on. Now you might ask, isn't a dark tone needed to express the suffering this character is going to go through? Callas herself said she tried to find a more melancholic colouring. Well, to start with, remember it's the contrast, chiaroscuro, that creates the drama. Sticking to any one tone is going to limit expression and become monotonous. For a role like this one, you need more than just dark and bright. You need a whole colour palette. And we're going to hear all that and more in Act 4, when things have got desperate for our poor Leonora. In this act, we have two of Puccini's muses singing for us. First, Emmy Destin, with her voice of great power, body and vibrant quality. Dramatic in expression, flexible and wholly subservient to her intentions, which are those of a singer of keen musical feeling and intelligence. In this opening recitative alone, she demonstrates a whole range of expressive effects. She varies her vibrato, she uses tonal contrast and sobbing and sighing effects to convey the strength of the emotions Leonora is feeling. Oh. 
we can hear Callas use the same sobbing, sighing effects in the aria. But Kala stays with the melancholy colour throughout the phrase. Whereas Destin lightens and sweetens the tone to pick out the word comfort. And I don't know how she does that, by the way. <laughs> Callas is not lacking in feeling in this aria, though, and she can lighten it when she wants to, as in the cadenza. Bonus Destin Trill. Rosa Raiza was the owner of the enormous voice that inspired Puccini's Turandot, but she said, I was trained first as a coloratura. This gives the singer a thorough, solid training, the sort of training that requires eight or ten years to accomplish. But this is not too much time to give if one wishes to be thoroughly prepared to sing all styles of music. A soprano, if thus trained, can sing Lucia one night and Norma the next, Traviata one night, and Provatore the next. Here we can hear how she exploits the qualities of the different areas of her voice for effect, rather than trying to keep them uniform. We hear a middle register with chest resonance mix on Preci, contrasted with chest register on the same pitches Palpiti al cor, and she keeps the top notes light but piercing in head register Listen out again for the varied vibrato and the sobs. However, by this stage, the heavy voice Callas is using is getting harder to control, and it's actually throwing off the pitch and the rhythm. <laughs> Oh, 
Instead of Quel suona quelli preti, she sings Quel suona quelli preti. I would find it really tiring to sing the whole piece like that. And it doesn't sound easy for her either. That's one of the reasons why the old school would use dark tones sparingly. It sounds much easier for Raiza. Last but not least, we have Eugenia Burzio. Her performances were too intense for some audiences, and apparently her studio recordings are quite subdued compared to how she was on stage. Perhaps I should take a warning here from Rodolfo Celletti, who said that it was absurd to draw parallels between her and Callas. Indisputably, Burzio's voice was superior for volume, ring, mellowness, and variety of colour. Indisputably, Callas's was superior for extension, agility, virtuosity, and variety of inflection and intensity. We are going to compare them, though. Burzio puts the words first. Listen to how she leans into the words extreme. Estrema! And how can you ask me that? However, by relying too much on dark tone, at this point, Callas's words are becoming obscured. <laughs> Using the sobbing effect, Borzio sounds like she is tearfully and desperately pleading with the heartless Count. But notice how she drops the sobbing just before the high note to keep it nice and easy and goes back into it at the lower pitch. We can now no longer hear Callas's words at all, and the heavy sound here comes across as an angry Leonora shouting her demands at the Count. <laughs> Burzio only uses a forceful, darker tone like this to give impact to certain words, such as the line, my oath is sacred. <laughs> 
But we have to sympathise with Callas here because Burzio has Antonio Magini Coletti for a partner who can keep up with the incredible pace she sets. <laughs> And Callas is trying to duet with Leonard Warren, who has all the lightness and suppleness of a hippo on a trampoline. <laughs> So it's not hard to imagine how she ended up sounding like a hybrid of bel canto and verismo when she wasn't living in a bel canto bubble. I know from personal experience how hard it is to go out on a limb and do your own thing when everyone is pressuring you to fit in. It must have been so difficult as almost the only bel canto singer in her sphere and being constantly criticised for doing things differently to try and resist the influence of contemporary aesthetics. But wait a minute, 1950? That should be right in the middle of her golden years. The common narrative is that she sang her best in the early part of her career and had vocal difficulties later. Is it that simple? Her old friend Lord Harwood remembered what she had sounded like when he first heard her in 1947, and what had changed 20 years on. At that time, the voice, while a very individual one, was a very bright one, I remember. It had, uh, it was a very strong, dramatic voice, but it also had this tremendous, I don't know, bright overtones is all I can say. So, uh, well, yes, you have seen the difference probably more than I. I know I've felt the difference inside of me. I don't know how the voice has performed. But you, along with these uh, 20 odd years that we know each other, should have seen the change as a musician yourself. There was this tremendous, uh, not only power, but, but brilliance then. There's always been brilliance in your voice, but not quite such a bright brilliance. So what happened? Remember earlier I listed things that wear out a voice? They were forcing, overusing dark tone, overusing vibrato, and overusing your highest or lowest notes. Let's start with the latter. And I already know a lot of people are not going to like this theory. They knew back in the 18th and quite possibly 17th century that regularly showing off the extremes of your range would sacrifice freshness and lusciousness of tone. It thins the voice. And in her early career, Callas was the queen of interpolated high notes. <laughs> She would throw them in to compete with other singers, and because she knew the audience would go crazy for them. Sadly, it seems her teacher, a high soprano herself, not only didn't warn her about this, she might have even encouraged it. Le colorature, le tenor, tout. C'est pour cela qu'elle avait cette uh, idée de chanter, de faire les notes élevées. Je me disais, est-ce que je pourrais le faire, les piquetades Je dis, si tu continues comme ça, oui, tu pourras faire tout. Tout. Mais si tu travailles comme tu travailles maintenant. However, Elvira de Hidalgo had warned her against forcing, which was becoming fashionable. Even so, Elie Nicolaidi, who was her accompanist in 1944, recalled that baritone Evangelos Manglivaras taught her to force. Nicolaidi believed that this strenuous technique was responsible for developing a wobble and a hardening of her tone. On stage we develop terrible habits. So every now and then you must have someone tell you, you do this, you do that, take it off, it's not good. Now, clean it up. There's a popular theory that when you lost some weight in 1953, your breath support suffered as a result. I'll tell you exactly how it was. 
I wasn't feeling well then. I couldn't move freely. I was tiring myself. I was perspiring too much. And I really was working too hard. When I went to Rome to sing Lucia, it was such a hard ordeal for me in the first act. I was getting so heavy that even my vocalising was heavy. How interesting. Well, because if you're overweight, then it's too tiring. Try and carry around 30 kilos on your back. Let's see how you can walk after a while. You can't do it. So I was annoyed. I darkened the colour and all that. But it's nonsense. You can't do that. So you felt much better after you lost the extra weight? Yes, then I really felt well. So it's possible that in her early career she was picking up bad habits that were not part of her bel canto schooling. But in her later career, in the late 1950s and early 60s, I don't think it was necessarily technique that was getting in her way. As we talked about last time, she had many health troubles. I'm not going to go into detail about them again. If you want to know more, watch this previous video. But briefly, aside from having nervous breakdowns around this time, her neurological symptoms, jaw, sinus and ear inflammation, fatigue and multiple hernia operations are just a few of the things that would have had a major impact on her singing. I wasn't happy. I was very tired. I wasn't happy with what I was doing. Something wasn't working, either in my technique or in my nerves or in my private life. Do you feel your technique changed as a response to your health changing? The instrument wasn't responding like I wanted it to. The instrument must obey you perfectly. There's no escaping that, the scores and so on. You can't just say, I can't reach that note. Not every day is a good one, but the maximum must always be more or less achieved. So you pushed through, even when it wasn't feeling right? I went on singing for years when I wasn't happy. When did that start? I should say, uh, by 1957, I didn't enjoy singing anymore, because it scared me so. By 1965, I knew I had to stop altogether. My fans, my public, everyone thought I was wonderful. But afterwards, when I'd get home, I'd ask myself, Maria, leaving aside the applause, were you happy with it? And I wasn't. I never think that I'm marvellous, but to not even be as good as what I was used to, there's a difference. Great art is to give what's most difficult with the greatest ease. It wasn't that easy for me, so I didn't sing at all for a year. Then I went back to my teacher, Elvira de Hidalgo, and I started taking lessons, patiently, just like a new student. So that's why I don't think it's as simple as that she sang well for a few years and then she didn't sing so well. I don't think she ruined her voice. But I also don't think she always sang with the purest, healthiest bel canto technique. What I could not do 18 years ago, I can do now. What I did better 18 years ago because I was young, I might not do now. In other words, I have improved other things, I might have spoiled other things. Well, the older you grow, the less you want to give in to feebleness. But unfortunately, what you do improve here, you might spoil there. Mm -hmm. This is important to be aware of because if you're a singer who, like many others, wants to take her for a model, make sure you only copy the best bits. She can serve as both an inspiration and a warning. Despite the ups and downs, she became a legend, and deservedly so. Her fans, then and now, were and are moved by her soulful singing and astonished by the versatility of her technique. But I wouldn't crown her the greatest of all time. 
Because, for me, when comparing her with her predecessors, even at her best, I often find her less expressive. I don't know if that was something lacking in her training or a choice. And we've only heard some tiny extracts of four other singers today, so I encourage you to go and listen to more of them and let me know if you agree and if you'd like to hear some more direct comparisons. Also, although she was right when she said that in the past versatility was the norm, even then there were some exceptional talents that stood out. Long before her much-lauded feat of singing Brunhilde and Elvira in the same week, there was Emma Calvé singing Carmen and Ophelia in the same week, or Maria Malibran singing Fidelio and La Sonnambula in the same evening, or Marietta Alboni singing not just the contralto and soprano roles, but even baritone. It was said that Adelina Patti could sing any music that was ever written. She excelled in comic roles such as Zerlina and Rosina, but she was also a sensational Aida. And we can also compare Callas with a direct contemporary from the bel canto school, another dramatic coloratura soprano who really could rival her, almost role for role. My teacher, Ray Woodland. When it comes to range of repertoire, she left Callas far behind. She sang everything from the Baroque era, which she loved, through possibly her signature role, The Queen of the Night by Mozart, all the Verdi, Wagner, etc., up to her favourite role, Mimi by Puccini, 20th century musical theatre numbers, and new works by contemporary composers she inspired, such as Benjamin Britten, Arthur Bliss and Michael Head. But although she had an international career, she chose to not go as high pressure as Callas did. She actually turned down an invitation to La Scala in Milan. So maybe that's how she managed to avoid compromising her bel canto training and never lost her voice. The purpose of this video is to prove the truth of what Callas said herself. It doesn't take anything away from her achievements because her place in the history of opera is secure. I just think it's a shame for her that she wasn't born a century earlier, when she could have had some of the best teachers ever and real competition which would have pushed her to be even better. But it's fortunate for us that she was born when she was so that we could benefit from her. And because she proved that even an echo of bel canto is a marvel to those who have never heard it before, isn't it good news that she wasn't unique in history? That means there's the possibility we can create another Callas. We just have to revive the old school. The question is, how? Or does it even matter if the tradition dies out? Music is the straight way to go to the heart and to the mind of people. So the main thing, I believe, though I give enormous attention to the words, I try to find truth in the music. That is what creates the intangible power of transporting the public into a higher, uh, well, bringing them above the normal. Transcendence. Exaltation. Exaltation, exactly. Maybe the luckiest thing that happened to me in my early career was that I was coached by Tullio Serafin. He taught me exactly the depth of music. This is what we learn from old people when we start so young and we are growing as artists. They hand on to us centuries of accumulated experience. Tradition, yes. We are short of good tradition today. There's a lot to it. A lot of devotion, dedication, sacrifice. 
Art is really so great that it frightens me sometimes. What I learned from Seraphine was that you must serve music, because music is so enormous and can envelop you into such a state of perpetual anxiety and torture. But it is our first and main duty. Now, it's very difficult because we're only human. And the more you do music, the more you serve music, the more you realize you do very little for music. What I take from this is that it needs to be a community effort. It's too much for just one star, no matter how inspirational, to do all on her own. Even if another callus comes along, after the proper schooling, she will need the support of conductors, composers, performers, directors, and most importantly, of the audience. I'm always speaking about the audience because, after all, we do perform for them. We can't just perform for ourselves or the conductor. But what if they prefer certain aesthetics which aren't actually healthy singing? Then should we compromise to please them? The public likes good taste, but cannot always understand what it likes. Also, as years go by, one thing is accepted and later on it is not accepted. So, we have to adapt ourselves, though with an old art. But hasn't that been the problem? Adapting and compromising has just led to everyone forgetting what bel canto really used to be. You said earlier that as a singer you have to set yourself a standard to hold yourself accountable. Yes, we must. It's our duty. It's our first duty. To ourselves, to music especially, because we serve a very beautiful thing and a high art. It's one of the fine arts. But I think the audience is also responsible for, and entitled to, demanding a high standard, not just listening passively to anything they're offered. But how can they do that if they're not even aware of what good is? We have to teach the public, or rather, gently show them the way sometimes. How can the public know beforehand what we have taken years of devotion and study and scientific work over? We perform an opera and they have to understand in one evening? It isn't possible. So, really, if we could teach the public all these technical difficulties or the way we work, even if we could have lessons, it would be most interesting and most profitable for them too. They would love opera much more and they would understand the good things and the bad things and have less patience or more patience, and they would love us a little more too. Well, that's what I hope to do with this channel, in a welcoming way, because opera shouldn't be exclusive. I hope we're creating an involved and enthusiastic audience that will be as knowledgeable as the singers. The audience and we have to go forward, hand in hand, taking the same path. And if everything goes well, then there really is this exaltation, this enthusiasm, this art, this something we can't quite explain. I believe we need to bring back the old schooling because that's what, even with some adaptations or additions, continues to amaze listeners to this day. And fortunately, that can be recreated. There's a tendency for people to talk about you as a real one-off, as though everything you did was pure talent, rather than a product of a tried and tested method. And I think that can be used as an excuse to not even try to follow your example. At the time there was resistance, I might say even resentment. There were colleagues who'd say, oh, we were doing fine before she came along. For heaven's sakes, why now must we work doubly hard? So do you think you raised the standard? You know, I must say that I've caused a little bit of change and I hope a better change in our art. I think there are more people today trying to copy you, but without the technique to support it. They try to copy the result without the method. Well, everything's too quick today. Even careers are quicker. You can become greater easily because we don't have too much, as they say in Italian, uh, concorrenza. Competition. There is too little competition. A beautiful voice is an immediate success. And if you're easily applauded, you say, well, why should we work harder? And you stop working. So, when you're an immediate success, 
It is rare that you last long. This channel, of course, is dedicated to re-establishing the Bel Canto School. My life is dedicated to that aim. Making this video, looking back at how that went last time it was attempted, has made me think about what I'm trying to do. Although I believe in it, what chance do I have of persuading new generations to embrace what previous generations rejected? How can I convince anyone that it could be worth it? It must take an enormous degree of willpower, I should think. You love. Know. Excuse me, Mr. Dance. It's not willpower. Ah, that's... This is devotion and love, to serve what you adore. Yeah, that is stronger yet. Ah, oh, yes. Yes, because it's, uh, you can't do this out of willpower. It takes a lot of love. There was a belief, or feeling, or attitude in the old school, of considering it as a sort of spiritual calling, a way of serving a higher power. So I wonder, is that strong feeling and devotion necessary for the amount of hard work that is required? The trouble is that not only it never stops, but the more you learn, the less you know that you have learned. You find more problems, more difficulties, more passion, more love, because it's something intangible. Do you think that people today can still feel that way? Today people have many more things. They have everything at their disposal. So they have less time to sing, less time to study, feel, gather ideas, this all amounts to the same problem. A hundred years ago, the public was different. They used to think differently. Now, people are less patient. And they're less naive. But you were saying before that feelings don't change. We are essentially the same. We are human. I firmly believe that we are, in the depths of our souls, romantic, sentimental, only we don't want to show it. We don't have courage to feel. We're afraid of what other people will think. So how do we overcome that? I think that youth should find strength. Even if others will say, oh, how stupid you are, how ridiculous, how old fashioned. It's a matter of strength, of believing in what you believe. A career lasts a long while if the attitude that you have towards it is healthy and old fashioned which is always modern because it is always strung to its basic feeling. Timeless. Yes. What do you think? Can our young audiences today come to appreciate a highly skilled craft like this again? Can young students feel strongly enough to devote themselves entirely to it? Perhaps a hundred years of convenience and consumer culture has taught us to appreciate what we traded for it. Maybe the time is ripe for Belcanto to return. She takes the stage as Rachel must have taken it. Visually, she is magnificent. Musically, she exerts so much willpower and bends art to her fashioning in such an imperious manner that one guesses that even if she were to whistle the music or play it on a violin instead of vocalizing it, she would still make us hang upon her every phrase. She is, in short, the very antithesis of your canary soprano, your empty, unmusical prima donna. And yet, those with critical ears can scarcely fool themselves that she was not often singing sharp on Saturday, that her tutta forza was invariably sour and that her climactic high notes often developed a zagging beat like the sound of a plank being sawn. Moreover, the actual timbre of the voice often sounded nasal and blocked. Free emission, the sound of a voice of natural beauty vibrating in perfect harmony, the noise, say, made by Madame Flagstad or the late Kathleen Ferrier, was simply not in evidence. But such is Madame Callas' witchcraft that one was utterly resigned to including her second scene of Act Two among the supreme experiences of opera. So, after all, was Maria Callas the greatest of all time? Probably not, no. 
but she would have been extraordinary in any century for her musical genius, her acting talent, her magnetic presence, and her strength of will to surmount almost any difficulty, fed by her devotion to her art. Because of these qualities, audiences found a profound connection with what she was doing. She continues to entice new fans in a way no other opera singer, dead or alive, does. She reminded us of what opera should be. She gave us a glimpse of what it was like in the golden age full of thrilling stars with mass appeal. And to me, she represents what it could be again. She gives me hope that bel canto truly is timeless. And that, as she believed, we can build a passionate community again through gentle teaching and guidance, and not accepting any imitations or substitutions. I want you to remember, possibly, whatever I've said. I don't know whether I'll be here next year, but I want you to please try and remember, please try and make it that I, that all this effort is not wasted, that you should take whatever little I've given you and increase it. Each and every one of you, it doesn't stop here, it has to keep on going, because you're supposed to follow up what we have done, whether you see me again or not doesn't make any difference. You are the younger generation and you must continue it. And that's the only thanks that I really do want. Keep on going. And the proper way, not with an easy applause, but with your real feeling, whatever it is. Uh, this is what I want to say and I'm not good at words, so uh, that's that.